welcome to our virtual space, where thought leaders who in a variety of ways have committed themselves to improving our lives, share their work, perspectives on current affairs, and what brought them to where they are today. My name is Rob Liu, and this is The Exchange. Kevin Smith, thank you so much for joining us on The Exchange and taking time to share your perspective as a leader in the high school setting. So as you know, quite often families think about what their children are doing with their teachers. They have a sense that high schools have leadership, if you will, and that those leaders are so important to the policies and the running of schools, etc. But I have a suspicion from families that I've spoken to that they often don't really know all the different things that a leader in a high school setting needs to really worry about and the sorts of things that you do. So you are the associate head of school at the Fenway High School, am I correct? That is correct. Right, so can you share with the audience in that, in that leadership role at Fenway High, what do you really worry about? What do you focus on? I, I think my focus has been multifaceted, right? We have to make sure that the lights are on in the building. Uh, you know, I, I think that that's, that's a standard thing. Uh, we have to worry about educational outcomes. We have to worry about student safety. We have to worry about teacher safety. We have to worry about how our buildings are functioning, what remote learning looks like, uh, what are the protocols are the tools that are going to make sure that our students are successful, our teachers are successful, our families are heard. Uh, we have to worry about uh, sort of district policies, statewide policies, and synthesizing all of those different pieces and making sure that they fit into our school settings in a, in a way that is not only productive for us, um, but really fruitful for all parties involved, uh, you know, and, and some other things that we are thinking about now is we've formulated so many partnerships within the community. How do we continue to think about those partnerships and, and make sure that they work, whether it's remotely or in person, you know, so we're, we're planning for everything. We're planning for a remote setting, a hybrid setting, an in-person setting. Um, and I'm not sure you know, what that will look like in the fall, but uh, we have to make sure that everything is, is on the table. Of course, and it's, it's very clear that, I mean, so Fenway is, is a Boston public school. Um, it's, a, it's a BPS. Um, there's a diversity of students there. So as we had to do the switch to remote learning, one of the things that came up so clearly is that the variable backgrounds and home settings of our students really presented a range of challenges that quite often we didn't have to deal with before. Can you share with us how you at Fenway, sort of what you saw in that regard and how the school thought about trying to get students to be able to learn from home when home can be a very different place from one student to another? Oh man, I think this is, this is an incredible question. You, you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs and we start with sort of the basic needs, food, shelter, home, et cetera. Uh, and that naturally, I think, is instinctually becomes the first concern. So immediately as this happened, you know, I think the district was looking at how do we continue to provide the services that students get in schools outside of school? How do we bring that home with them? And, and that was a real challenge. Uh, what we did immediately was we rushed and we got gift cards, we uh, connected with food banks, connected with different organizations, and we personally hand delivered food to our students uh, or gift cards to our students so that they could uh, have access to, to food. Uh, you know, there are a number of our students who were homeless. And what we had to do is, is ensure that they also had or could be safe uh, and have, because before you access the education piece, you have to access those other pieces. So everything was on the table and we had to move quickly. Uh, our mental health services kicked in pretty quickly as well as our student support team. Uh, 
uh, they they were on the ground running, delivering food as well, but making sure that they were setting up appointments, whether it was via Zoom or phone calls, uh, you know, for students and families to make sure everyone was safe, accounted for, uh, and all questions that were being that were asked were were be were able to be handled. You know, we had we set up charts to make sure that all all students and families were accounted for. We sent out surveys. Uh, many of the surveys weren't filled, you know, so what that usually would look like is we would find another means. And what that did end up happening was we made phone calls, uh, sometimes even went to folks' homes and had distance conversations with, with individuals who, you know, were, were hard to reach. But we did everything. It was truly by any means necessary at that point in time uh, to make sure that our students were set up to learn. Um, and, and what I've now learned is that, you know, I think it's important to plan uh, sort of in spite of all of the different directives that are coming from different directions uh, so that, you know, because we know what our students need in the moment, uh, and, you know, initially education took a back burner to everything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, what's really fascinating is that, I mean, you always do this in high schools, but the element of sort of the pastoral care of your students is so critical. And in a crisis like this, it clearly extended way beyond the boundaries of the classroom. It always does. But clearly what you've just described is the degree to which you and Fenway really reached out in a truly substantive way. And that's amazing to hear. It's really fantastic, you know, to hear that. But yeah. I'm so, um, Gavin, one thing I'd like to ask you about is that, so clearly you have a very interesting background. You're bounced back and forth between Jamaica and the United States. I'm Jamaican, you're Jamaican. So we, so we yeah. have that in common. That's kind of a fun thing. <laughs> um, and it's interesting, right? When you think about where you end up and what you're doing today, sometimes you can look back over your background and there might be a person, there might be sort of an event, something like that, where you can look at that and say, you know, that person or that event, that situation, um, I could say really has played a critical role in who I am today and how I ended up where I am today. So I'm sure that our viewers and listeners are curious, how did Gavin Smith end up where he is today? And is there something, a person or an event in his background that he can share with us was sort of important to that? You know, we love to tell stories in Jamaica. Totally. Um, and, <laughs> and, <laughs> I am uh, from Appleton Estates. I am a product of plantation. Uh, in, in every way possible. My great grandmother is illiterate and her mother was a slave essentially on the land of Appleton. So uh, she was a sharecropper. Uh, many of my family members still work at Appleton Estates uh, in, in similar capacities to what you would consider a sharecropper today. Uh, just is how sort of where we come from works. That is one of the main economic um, staples within, within our community. Uh, so, you know, my mother, I would say, would be that person and the stories that were shared and sort of how education impacted her life and brought her to where she, she got to, right? And then making sure that that was the same for us. Uh, she came from a teenage mother was, who had her at 14 years old uh, and was raised by my great grandmother uh, to the point where she was illiterate, as I mentioned before, but my mother was, uh, went to the most prestigious boarding school in, in Jamaica called Hampton. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, she did this on literally slave money, right? Uh, Appleton Estates paid for her schooling. Uh, that was the University of West Indies, as well as everything that she needed to be successful at Hampton. So just knowing sort of the impact of education and how it has literally transcended uh, her and her social capital, her experience, 
really shifted and cultivated my desire to be who I am today. Uh, and it's never without forgetting or um, sort of where I came from, know from whence you came, you know, we still go back home and it's still the same zinc, uh, zinc roof and, you know, hurricane and uh, water, water from the well, you know, we, we go home and it's, it's still uh, the same rich traditions, still, still Appleton, still St. Elizabeth, still Silo, uh, that really empowers me to continue to press on and to work and create opportunities for other students who were marginalized my, like myself and my mom. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, <clears throat> this issue of marginalization is something that is getting, as it should, sort of increasing attention right now. And it appears as if not only has COVID-19 created an overall crisis, both economic, social, and political, um, all over the world, but the simultaneity of that pandemic with what has happened with the senseless killing of George Floyd and an increasing awareness of racial injustice and its costs, if you will, the fruit of that horrible sort of a systemic situation, when you put the two of them together, I think what you're starting to see, of course, is a much clearer sense of disparity and what disparity actually means. And disparity among so many axes, be it in the classroom, be it in job opportunities, be it in your health, right? And so increasing, I mean, this is something I know that you care a great deal about. And so in the face of all that is happening right now, and the emergency room triage that you're doing to try and make sure that your school comes back sort of in a way that works in, in the fall. But stepping out of the ER for a little bit, the emergency room, how do you see this increased awareness of disparity hopefully translating into some actions that will actually help to address it? You know, let's say in the high school setting, what's your hope? I, the, the hope is, is what it's always been for me, right? I, I don't think that the situation has changed in any way for me. This has been my normal. This has been our students' normal. So I think what has become pretty clear is that there are many people who weren't aware that some of these things were happening and are now heavily impacted and searching for ways to make an impact in, in this work. Uh, so my hope is, has always been to create opportunities for our students to have access to uh, these, these opportunities, these seats at the table. You know, if, if you want to be part of the work, education is a great place to do it. Uh, molding the minds of the youth is a great place to do it. Uh, so offer opportunities, whether it's an internship, whether it's a sponsorship, whether it's allyship, whether it's coming to a career fair, right? Um, we, we need help. It takes a village has always been the notion, right? And, and the village cannot be, as, as we're seeing, sitting back and watching. Everyone has to be actively involved and genuinely involved in the pursuit of education for our students, for marginalized students, uh, because what it means to be marginalized is not have the same opportunities, right, to be looked at differently. And if that is true, then as we say with co-conspiratorship as opposed to allyship, how do you give up some of the power that you have to ensure that others are successful as they uh, transition into adulthood, into life outside of the walls of school, because that is what I worry about most. You know, school, as we see, is this bubble that creates a safety net for our students. Um, but school also has to create opportunities uh, for our students to have uh, so that they can go to schools, so that they can enter places that they typically wouldn't enter, so they can be in spaces that aren't welcoming to them, right? So that we can shift the narrative of what America is. Um, and I, I think that that is what is really important. That's the message that 
I share with my teachers, my staff, right? Uh, in order to be anti-racist, we really need to start a, sort of start knocking on doors and kicking them in and saying, you know, we're here, right? Like this is, we are welcomed here, we belong here. Um, and this is what we have to contribute to uh, sort of this space, right? It, is, it isn't just the academic components, but it is the components that make us us. Right, that, that we have to contribute to this space. And, and my students are wonderful, resilient, going through so many things right now, uh, yet and still they have to, you know, what I know is they have to function in the society that isn't always welcoming to them. So my job is to prepare them for that. Our job as educators is to prepare them for that, you know, and the job of everyone else who's listening and watching and uh, wondering what they can do is to sort of break those things down so that those, those boundaries or those barriers no longer exist uh, and you know, opportunities are more fruitful and robust for our students. Really well said. Um, <clears throat> I think one thing that has been in my mind a lot lately <clears throat> is what stories really get told. We talked about storytelling before and how much as Jamaicans we love that. Um, what stories get told and actually who gets to tell the story? ultimately. And for a number of years, what's been striking me is that as a, someone that teaches biology in college, you know, as the years have gone by, I've really focused a lot on, you know, greater active engagement of students, really getting them more sort of application focused in terms of their own understanding of science, etc. But it was maybe a few years ago that I realized that while I was doing all of that, I was still pretty much telling the same stories, the same stories I was told, right, when I was learning science, stories of people that really were nothing like me at all. And so I quickly realized is that we have such a narrowness in terms of the story, in terms of the curriculum that we're basically selling, if you will, to our students. And I think it speaks to what what, what you were saying systemically, now is the time to kind of crack that open far more. Open up the voices and the stories and what people have done with science, what they're currently doing with science, etc., to make it clear that our students, especially our students of color, um, don't feel that my only road to success is performing. And performing in a very specific way Absolutely. because ultimately if that's what we're doing we're not helping the situation ultimately no i you know i'm a former high school biology teacher and i think that again that's how i always approach my class right we are going to be sort of this counter narrative um when i remember walking into class and one of the first questions i asked my ninth graders what are you interested? What do you want to be? And, you know, most of them put their hands up and said doctors, right? Uh, doctors who had very little science background before because sort of the nature of the public school system that, that they're in, right? Doctors who their only experience with being a doctor is watching television, right? Doctors who, who when I ask them what their favorite subject is, would often tell me history or English, right? And that they hated science. <laughs> so, you know, for me, it was, it was like, how do, you, how do you change that narrative, right? Um, how do you begin to introduce students to people who look like them, people who share the same lived experiences that they do, uh, whether it's historically or not? You know, when I uh, graduated from high school, my entire family came up from Jamaica and I got about three copies of Gifted Hands, right? Because Ben Carson was, was sort of that person uh, that we all wanted to be, right? Um, but there, there were many more as I learned uh, and navigated the space, right? So for me, it's always been, how do I make sure that you know that this will be your experience, that you will have to do some level of switching, uh, code switching, 
uh, and navigating this experience, as well as how do I prepare you to be who you fully are in this academic setting and bring that to the table, right? Because both are really important. If the majority of my students are saying they want to be doctors, how do I get them to achieve their dreams, right? What does that look like for me uh, as an academic? Uh, it is pushing them to, to see what that actually means, right? Biology courses are hard. They are some of the hardest courses that you will take in college. Sciences, for, for that matter, whether it's biology, engineering, et cetera. Right, so how do I give them a dose of that in the high school setting? How do I combine sort of the hands-on experiences that we know that our children need with the lecture-based experiences that we know take up the majority of college classes, right? Um, you know, it, I can't run from that. It, it is the reality of the situation. And I cannot, you know, while we can say that there's systemic things wrong with that, um, you know, it's very important that I prepare my students to be successful in those settings. So, you know, thinking about continuing to have conversations with college professors, with colleges, with my own teachers about what preparedness looks like, right? Not just preparedness academically, because studies have shown that um, students, students of color, uh, black students, they do persevere through their first year. They receive similar results. But what ends up happening is they drop, right? So why does that drop happen, right? Why, why isn't there persistence, uh, right? Um, there are settings where there are, you know, Freeman Hoprowski is studied religiously about what he's done at UMBC uh, to the point that that program is being replicated in, in many other settings, many high performing settings as well, um, because it works, right? So what can we do to cultivate that 45% of students of color who say they want to be doctors? Uh, you know, it, it's real. 45% shouldn't turn into five. We know that, that the numbers are low in terms of persistence in general. Um, but also, hey, there's more than being a doctor. You can be, uh, um, you can be in bio, biotech, right? You could be involved in biotech. You could be involved in biomedical engineering. You could be involved in so many fields. So how do we expose kids, students to these different fields uh, so that they know what options are available to them and they know what the, the work it takes to get there will be and they have the supports they need to be successful. Absolutely, really empowering our students to tap into, identify their own passions and then aligning that with the universe of options, I think is one of the greatest things that any school you know, be it a high school, a middle school, or a college, could really do for a student. Um, so Gavin, let me ask you a, a sort of a very different question. Yes. I mean, it's very clear, the sort of important work that you're doing at Fenway High School. Um, it's very clear what your passions are about making sure that students are activated, if you will, to maximize what their potential might be. But when you're not doing all of these things, Right. Can you share with our audience, what does Gavin Smith do otherwise? <laughs> <laughs> what are there other things that really get you excited and you and you do like cooking or, you know, something completely different? Those who know me will tell you this is my work. This is my passion. This is my life. Uh, really and truly it, it is so. Uh, you know, I, I run a, a group for young men, um, young men of color. I uh, do mentoring on Saturdays. I'm on uh, boards for different organizations that are educational related. But you do ask a very good question, right? I, I read. I, I read a lot. I, knowledge is power, always educating myself. I am an avid runner, have been for a long period of time in my life, you know, uh, coming from Jamaica as, as school boys, that's what we did, you know, took our shoes off and ran in our khaki suits uh, throughout, throughout the schoolyard. And that has just continued in, in my lifetime uh, as, as a focus of my, how I release, right? I'll go on a five mile run, I'll, uh, I enjoy cooking. I enjoy spending time with family and loved ones. 
you know, I, I enjoy travel greatly and, and traveling to many of the uh, countries or um, places that my students are from so I can learn more about their cultures. Uh, and what I see is that there's a lot of overlap, you know, whether it's visiting the Dominican Republic or Puerto Rico, looks very similar to Jamaica, Cuba, same thing. We even eat the same food, uh, you know, <laughs> call, it, call it different things, but yes. we really do. Uh, so while language may be a barrier, I always say, you know, like our experiences are really similar. And I actually love your country because it reminds me of home. Uh, so I, I think those are things that I, I truly do uh, for fun. When I travel, I try to turn my phone off because that's probably the only time that I fully unplug. Uh, so I really try to pick remote places so that that can actually happen. Very healthy, very healthy. And by the way, I, ha I have to say that um, as someone that is in a constant, never ending mission to find good Jamaican food, um, and have frequently substituted Cuban food um, or food from, from the Dominican Republic. You're right, there's a lot of amazing similarities. There is one difference though, which initially caught me by surprise. Jamaican food has the heat. Oh yes. That's the thing. I mean, Cuban food, Puerto Rican food, it's not hot generally. Yeah. The spice, the scotch bonnets are not there. And so yeah. it's kind of like a mild version. <laughs> Very much so. I would agree with that completely. Yeah. You know, Jamaican food, you'll be eating the rice and you find a piece of the pepper in there and you say, wow. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, yes. And so it's, um, I have to say, it's, it's, it's a hard thing. I mean, I have the worst time finding sort of Jamaican food, um, both here, but also even going to New York, et cetera, it's not as easy as I would have thought. I mean, going to Queens, it yes. wasn't quite as easy as I thought it really would have been. But um, anyway, afterwards, we need to have a conversation about where to find good um, um, Jamaican food. <laughs> I agree. I'm still looking as well. Yes, I know. It is like, an oh, there used to be an amazing place in Cambridge that used to be my go-to place. And then that closed. And so that was like an, an, an enormous loss. But anyway, we will, we will talk about that at another time. Um, Gavin, we had talked about sort of things in your past and you had talked about your mom, how critical she was for you in terms of your commitment to education and realizing the power of education. Um, if we also ask you to look back over your past, there are often times where you come to a fork in the road and you go either left or right. And quite often, the fact that you might have gone left instead of right had a dramatic impact on really what you're doing now. So what's sometimes fun to think about is that, well, let's suppose instead of left, you had gone right. In an alternate universe in the multiverse, if you had gone right, would there be a Gavin Smith out there doing something quite different or not? What do you think? Uh, I think that's why I taught ninth grade because that was probably the year for me, right? <laughs> and again, that comes back to my mother being the North Star. Um, I had many um, really positive influences, males, um, black males in my life who were uh, really empowering me to go down the path of being a musician, um, not because they, told me to be a musician, but because um, the music program at my high school in, in Uniondale, New York, was an incredible program and one where I, as a child who sort of uh, was roamed in the middle in terms of popularity, um, definitely one of the top students academically, um, but, but sort of got lost socially. Um, and, and they were the ones that really, really brought me up. But I wonder what would have happened had I not had sort of those experiences and those people to, to really lift me uh, at that time, you know, that is so critical as, as youth, you know, we're growing up and we start to see and experience different things. I think for me, that is around the time many of my friends did actually choose to go left uh, and I went right. 
Uh, so I often wonder as an educator, what are the things that made me go right uh, mm. and made them go left and look at some of their lives and some of you know, their decisions. And what I always said to my students is, it's really hard for me to say this, but at 14 years old, 15 years old, you're going to make some decisions that are going to really impact the rest of your life. Right. And, and for me, it's really important that I'm here to not only help you with those decisions, but to let you know that that's, that's sort of how the world works, you know, and when you're, when your brain is a 14 year old brain, you're like, ah, oh, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Right. But it's really important for me to show them because, you know, I, I can tell stories now of students that I've had who, have just been incredibly hard-headed, <laughs> right? Uh, but when, you, when they're 20 and 21 now and you see what they're doing, you're like, oh, they were listening. They were taking those things in. And I think that's what I was doing. I was listening and I was taking in those things. Uh, and that helped me because, you know, from home, I always say I have, stu I have friends who are in jail. I have friends who are doctors. I have friends who are construction workers. I have the full gamut, right? Uh, it, it's all about sort of choices, um, you know, and the systems that are in place to allow uh, some choices that we in particular, as people of color make, to uh, impact our lives great more, more so than other, um, other denominations of people. Of course. So um, Lab Exchange has a tagline, learning without limits. And actually something I often tell my students, on the other hand, is that quite often it's pushing against limits and overcoming them that can be such a critical part of your formation. It gives you resilience, it gives you perspective, it forces you to think hard about what needs to be done and what you want, ultimately. Um, Gavin, can you share with us um, once again, thinking back to your past, either recent or, or further back, um, was there a particular limit or hurdle, a limitation or a hurdle that you overcame that was sort of an important part of making you who, who you are today? Mm -hmm. I think there are many, whether you can say being raised by a single mother, uh, being the oldest of four children, and taking on many of the father-like uh, roles within the family, right? Whether you can say it was being one of a few who were studying neuroscience uh, at my school, Northeastern University, and making it through as a person of color. Uh, you can also say uh, sort of the, the hiring practices within um, the school system and who they sort of promote uh, and, and what that looks like. You know, I remember I always share this story and it's, it's not a story that's off the record, but it's, you know, I remember uh, sort of really fighting really hard to get the job that I had when I was a teacher at John D. O'Brien, uh, where there were questions about whether I can do this work or not. Uh, that seemed absolutely absurd to me um, based on my lived experiences uh, and what I knew I was bringing to the table. Um, but what I was able to do is what I've always done, let my work speak for itself. Uh, and I think it was really interesting that when I was, when the person who was the director, the science director, before I got there, when he was retiring, you know, it was a question of whether Gavin should be this person when I first got there. And when he was leaving, this was two years later, he recommended me uh, as a 27 year old to be the head of the science department, right? And I think that that really speaks to the level of work and how passionate I am about uh, the work that I do, but also sort of the, the things that we have to overcome as people that sometimes really come from nowhere they're really uh sort of ambiguous and right like that that hurt a lot 
but also sort of and there was some level of vindication when I was mm -hmm. ah you know this man is saying that I am the person that I have truly done the work uh, to lead not only to be part of this community but to lead this community in science and I think that that was one experience for me that was just like really affirming continue to do what you do um, because you you do it well right and and what you don't need is people telling you that you can't because of who you are or because of where you come from, right? Or because of your age or whatever the circumstance may be, right? Um, but I, I think that that would most, those would be just a few of the, the ones that I can think of. Of course, and I think it really underscores the importance of having that drive to push against these external limitations that are placed on you. And I mean, once again, we, you know, we talked about what the individual can do that's experiencing this kind of systemic sort of structure of injustice, but what others can do. And I think, you know, you, you see this time and time again, the requirement to overprove yourself, right? That you can't just be good. You have to be way better than, them, right? You can't do two things. You have to do five things, right? I mean, you have to be so over <laughs> that then you get what someone would get for half of the things that you've done. It's a standard thing and I've seen it in my career as well. And one would hope that in time, that will change. And I certainly hope that that's the case. Um, so Gavin, thank you for sharing so much of yourself, so much that is motivating and inspiring. I know that our audience will absolutely appreciate it. So on behalf of the exchange and Lab Exchange, I can't thank you enough for spending the time to be with us today. Thank you.